uh, get rolling. Thank you all uh, for coming here on this humid uh, summer, summer day, but I think it will be eminently uh, worth it. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Taha Gassari has been able to uh, join us all the way from, uh, from Oxford. Uh, uh, Taha is, I think, in some sense, the very exemplar of what a computational, the sort of the fusion of computational social science and of a physicist uh, looking at large scale uh, human uh, behavior in various kinds of ways. I think um, uh, what's particularly attractive about his uh, research is sort of we, the interweaving of you know understanding and thinking about humans, uh, which sometimes sometimes is not incorporated in, in some some of uh, some of the more computational research, but like thinking about human cognition and how that how you're working between micro and macro, but really thinking about micro as well as macro uh, pa patterns. And I think. Uh, uh, I'm particularly looking forward uh, to his uh, talk today, which will be looking at uh, something that I, I, I find particularly intriguing, which is thinking about, uh, we'll find out, but around misinformation and, and how, um, and, and really, I think the emergence of going from microcognition to macro uh, patterns, which is, like I said, a really um, appealing uh, combination. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to his biography, but if you're interested, just Google him and he's the number one uh, top five. So, uh, so um, with that, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm absolutely the most famous and notable Taha Yasuri on this planet. <laughs> uh, but it's a true honor to be introduced to you by uh, David uh, because now I have computational social science in my job title. Uh, and David has written and has founded the field. So it's, it's a true honor to be here. And thank you so much for coming over. Um, I gave a talk last year, exact, almost exact the same time last summer, uh, but so it's becoming a tradition for me to come over, which is great for me. Uh, but there are a couple of differences between this talk and the talk last year. Last year I reported on published work over six, seven years where I studied Wikipedia and collected behavior and scale. Uh, I was very confident about what I was saying. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about things that are hot of the Press, not in the sense of publication, in the sense that I got it, most of the drafts from my students today or even yesterday. Uh, so if you are uh, having high expectations, I think I will disappoint you very quickly. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, literally any other video on YouTube would be better than this, just click and go to the next one. Uh, but I'm happy that this is being recorded for my own reference. So uh, why I'm talking about something that uh, I'm very uh, insecure about it is because this is, this is a topic that David has been leading for a while, and I want to have your feedback and your comments. So please feel free to stop me or interrupt me wherever you feel like, or uh, at the end of the presentation, I would very much like to receive some feedback from you. Well, this lady is to blame. Really, uh, it was about a year ago that she contacted me um, out of nowhere saying that, oh, actually, I know you are interested in prediction and human prediction processes. Um, we have this app called Play the Future, which is a prediction game. Uh, what want to chat. Um, actually, I was not into uh, the field of prediction and cognition and perception, really. I had one paper about prediction the movie success based on Wikipedia page views and editorial activities. Nevertheless, we had the conversation and it went very well. Uh, the, she introduced me to this game, which is primarily uh, from Canada. The, she's the CEO of the company called Play the Future. And the game is very simple. Uh, it gives you a piece of news, something is going on. Uh, for example, you know, there is a royal wedding happening, and then it asks you a question. In this case, how many people would be in the official photo of the royal wedding? And usually there are two hints. The first hint here says that, you know, how many people would be in the, in the official photo of royal wedding in, um, in Spain? And then there is a second hint, which is not unlocked primarily, but you can unlock it, and it gives you some more information. Here it gives more information about a previous British wedding and how many people were in that photo. You only have three keys, though, so you cannot use this second in that frequently. But the first key is open for everyone, the first hint, and then you submit your prediction. And when the wedding happens and when the news comes out, depending on the accuracy of your prediction, you get points. 
Uh, and then, you know, you, you can compare yourself to other people, and the closer you are to the prediction, the higher the points you get. Very simple. And uh, it's sometimes even stupid, because all the questions are about the future. No one knows the answer. And the questions could be that random. How many people will be in a photo? Or what's going to be the temperature tomorrow here? Or how many YouTube video, how many YouTube views uh, uh, Taylor Swift is going to have on Saturday between 10 to 11? Uh, but people love it. Uh, actually, they have uh, more than 300,000 registered users and they have more than 80,000 monthly active users playing the game. And I must say it's a bit addictive. I have tried myself. It's a way to get to know what is going on around the world, uh, particularly pop culture. Also, you feel so satisfied when you say, oh, actually, I've been very close in predicting the number of people Actually, there were 19 people in the wedding photo, and my personal prediction was 21. It gives me some sort of satisfaction to see, oh, I know that much about <laughs> British culture after living there for six years. <laughs> um, some people actually research and try to make an informed guess. I personally would just try to look at the hints and use my own judgment. Uh, it's interesting because uh, the gender balance is very good compared to most of the online games and mobile games. You have almost 50-50 between males and females. Uh, the geographical distribution of players is not that balanced. Well, as you see, it's mostly Canadian and American. Well, I think it's clearer here. Majority of users are from US, Canada, uh, Britain, Britain, and uh, a bit Australia and New Zealand. So it's an English type of, Anglo-Saxon type of game, which is understandable, but there are users from all around the world, from other countries as well. Um, let's just start with simple things. Um, how many times each person plays, how many predictions they make. As you can expect, it follows the typical fat tape, hover low, uh, whatever is that appropriate to say in this institute. Uh, hover low is the right term here. <laughs> Distribution, so majority of users play once or twice or a couple of times more, but there are a few people uh, whom we call uh, heavy users who, who play more than 1,000 games. They have been playing almost the entire history of the game. But it does follow this shape on live and scale. Uh, the similar pattern appears for questions. How many times or how many players play each question? It is not really a problem though, because majority of questions receive at least some level of interest. Uh, 40, 50 is the minimum number of answers that each question gets. Uh, some questions are very popular. They receive more than 1,000 responses. Majority of them are between you know, 200, 400 uh, responses. So it's a kind of more even distribution when it comes to answers per questions. Uh, one thing that you can uh, define, of course, is the error in prediction per, per individual per question. This is a typical answer, typical distribution you get uh, as an answer to, to a question. Um, uh, so in this case, there seems to be a bimodal distribution. Some people, majority of people, made the prediction of around 60. I don't remember what was the question. And some people made the prediction of around four, uh, sorry, 20. And they were right. This is the actual um, answer. And that's interesting that a good subset of users got it right. Uh, I wish I had put the question here. Even though the question is very random, intrinsically unknowable, but many people get it right. And that's very interesting. Uh, so you can define an error, which is the difference between the prediction and the actual value that comes up later, uh, normalized by the standard deviation of the whole population. So in this case, if you are close to this line, and if people are not that much, majority of them are not that close to this line, then you get a high score. When you look at the relation between your accuracy and the number of times you have played the game, you see there is a very clear positive correlation, which was a big puzzle to me, because again, the Christians are very random, very unpredictable, but people seem to be become better and better. However, the mechanism could be also other way around that. If you are good at the game, you stay longer and you play more and more. 
I think at the end, those happen. But here, each data point is a single user. We don't see the trajectory. But if you look at the trajectories, so here each line is a user, and the cumulative error that they have as a function of number of times they played. Uh, there seems to be some emergence or some convergence towards a rather low error. Uh, but people come from different trajectories. Uh, we looked into this data in a bit more detail and we identified two patterns. Basically, people who are not very good, they leave quickly, but people who stay around are already good, but they even become better and better as they play more and more games. Uh, so some learning is happening here, but this is something we are looking into that in more details, but I just wanted to show that because you might have some ideas. As I said, we have a very good gender balance, so we can compare two genders. Uh, here is the number of times each player has played the game, how many questions they answer. For female and male, they look almost identical. We have common users for both genders and casual users for both genders. When we look at the accuracy, uh, but we see a difference there. This is the accumulated accuracy for female and male, and we see that male players are a bit more accurate, and that's Pretty much the same thing is the median error of each player. As a function of number of times they play, the error decreases, but actually it decreases a bit faster for male players. But interesting, interestingly, at the end, they cross the same point. So heavy users are equally accurate between the two genders. Uh, also, casual users are equally accurate, but in between, males, uh, male users are doing a bit better. But um, this is, again, something that we should look into that more carefully because there are many other uh, parameters involved. Okay, let me show off by uh, showing you some of my own predictions. Uh, I have predicted that the, the World Cup winner is going to be from Europe, uh, obviously before the start of the tournament. Well, you might have predicted the same thing. Actually, 75% of players of the game had predicted that the winner is going to be from Europe. And if you've been in a cave over the past few weeks, France was the winner. <laughs> um, I predicted that Drake, uh, 26 Drake songs would be on the top 200 list on given Wednesday on Spotify. I got it absolutely right. <laughs> and more impressive was when I predicted the conversion rate between Canadian dollar and Swiss franc up to four digits. <laughs> and that wasn't trivial because the median of prediction was off and I was the, one of the best predictors. Uh, so just to give you an essence of the type of questions and how you can actually collect points. Now that I showed off my ability of prediction, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions but because we can't wait to see what happens, I asked a question about something that is already known, but you might not know. If you know the answer, maybe you don't want to play to ruin it for others, but uh, the question is about the German parliament, Bundestag. Uh, the question is that how many seats uh, it has, well, not how many seats, how many members it has. If you think that the number of members of the German parliament is more than 400, raise your hand. If you think it's less than 400, raise your hand. Okay. And now I want you to make a, make a guess. How many seats are in the German parliament? You can just say it. Okay. I, I want to hear more answers. 320. 320. 500 something. 500 something. Yeah, just give me a number. One more? 180. 180. Well, the actual number is 709. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that worked on you or not, but I've been trying to prime your mind around 400. 400 was a random choice. I chose it just because it's far from the actual number. I could not see because you didn't give me enough answers, but when I do that um, in parties and you know other fun places because <laughs> This is so cool. I get a lot of answers around 400, and that's so bizarre because there is nothing special about 400, 
but people start thinking around 400 because that was the previous number that they've heard in this context. Well, this is, this is not my invention. It's called anchoring, and it has been around and being used by many people in different contexts um, for many years. Actually, it has been very well studied, actually. Uh, a very simple definition is that the anchor is a number that serves as a reference point and subsequently influences people's estimate during negotiations, predictions, and shopping. So if I'm going to sell you this, if I start by saying $50 is my initial price, you might be happy to go a bit up and down, we might agree on 40. If I have started with 200, you might have been very happy with 150. You think, oh, I'm paying 50 less, whereas it's actually much higher than the other scenario. Of course, it only works if you have no idea what's the actual value of this pointer, which is, I think, $10. Um, so, I, I'm making a risk by going high and put an anchor in and see if it works on you or it's not working. And as you can guess, if the anchor is too far, probably it's not going to work. If I say, oh, let's just start talking about $5,000, probably you leave the room without any negotiation. So, there, there, is, there seems to be some complex behavior going on. Uh, it has been reported in many different contexts and sometimes in non-trivial way. Uh, even the anchor could be non-numeric, you know. They give you a stick and it's tall or short and they ask you a question. People who got the line with stick tend to give higher numbers. Uh, the most bizarre example is where people asked, uh, judges asked to come in, to, to pick a sentence, a prison sentence for someone and in front of them a die was rolled. And judges who had higher number on the die tend to give a longer sentence. And they could see that the number is random, but anchoring and defining is working on them nevertheless. So it's everywhere, it's very difficult to avoid, but um, you know, this is how our brain works. The way, why, why we do that, why is that beneficial, is because in many cases, this heuristic pattern is actually saving a lot of time. Instead of trying hard to discover the answer, I start with the given number and then go around finding the actual thing that I'm looking for. Here, there is a list of papers uh, where anchoring has been studied theoretically and empirically. Uh, in terms of theory, there are two main theories. I can go back if you want to take a picture. <laughs> in terms of theory, there are two main theories. Uh, uh, the first one is called anchoring and adjustment theory. It tells you that when you are given an anchor, you, you tend to believe that, but if it's too far from what you feel, you start coming down or getting closer to your feeling, and then you stop moving if you are happy, if it hits your margin of confidence. Uh, but where that margin is, we don't know, and that's why different people come up with different responses to the anchor. The other theory, which is called selective accessibility theory, tells that if there is an anchor, it ignites your attention towards evidences that you know around that answer. You tend to remember, oh, okay, yeah, 25 makes sense because that other guy said they bought something around the same price, but this is not happening in a fair way. You tend to remember things that are in uh, compatibility with the number that you are given. You uh, selectively consume the information you have, and that's why you kind of uh, come up with a number that is influenced by the anchor, but not necessarily directly. As you can see, these explanations are a bit complicated, and most importantly, not very quantitative, quantifiable, you know. They give the picture, but then they predict different behavior. For example, the first one does not explain the small anchors, you know. If the anchor is very close to my credit, to my impression, I, that shouldn't affect me. But actually, in some experiments, people have shown even small anchors have a, have a significant effect. Um, the, the closest to numbers I could find is from this paper, which predicts there could be three scenarios. I, that shows the response to the anchor versus the value of the anchor. It could be a linear increase. It could be a diminishing behavior. Or at some point, uh, there could be even a contrast. Uh, effect, you know, I give you a high anchor, you actually, that makes you go for lower values, which I don't have an example for, but uh, theoretically that could happen. Right, 
That was enough about anchoring, and why is that important? Because we make around 1,500 decisions in a given day. Have you thought about this? As you wake up, or maybe even you wake up, until you go to bed, you make around 1,500 decisions. Some of them are not that very important, like you know, uh, when I want to drink some water, but some of them could be very important. You might be voting for the UK to leave the EU. Or you might be uh, voting for someone who, might, uh, who wants to make the America great again. Um, so some of these decisions are very important. And then uh, you are bombarded by information like this. I don't know whether you've been following the Brexit campaign, but this is the Leave campaign. Putting this number on buses in London, that we send around 300, 350 million pounds per week to the EU. If we leave the EU, we're going to use this money to fund our national health services. That number was debunked right away. That was a grand number from the beginning. And actually, we know that this money is not now being spent on the NHS. But people, all people remember is 350 million per week. And uh, quite frankly, that works. That's enough for many people to make the decision. I have other examples here. Uh, the effect of vaccination on autism. Uh, the very great idea that President Trump has to publish weekly list of crimes committed by immigrants. Of course, there could be a list of crimes committed by non-immigrants, but when you keep seeing all oh, these immigrant names, you're, you are being anchored or you are being framed to think that all crimes are associated with immigrants. There are many examples of this. Um, so these are what we call cognitive biases, and anchoring is one of them. So, back to play the future. The game. Um, so, after those first analysis that we've done, we came up with this idea to use the application to run an experiment. Uh, that wasn't easy to convince the, the platform that Lady Paris saw to change the platform and let us use the platform to do experiments, but after a few negotiation rounds, we came up with this idea to to use a second hint as a treatment. So we have two groups of people, A and B groups, uh, and they get different hints if they want to have you to use a second hint. Remember, second hint is something you have to unlock using one of your three keys per day. And if you do that, you get some more information. To some group, we gave a high number, and to some group, we gave a low number. So if the question is that, what is the temperature going to be tomorrow? The first hint, which is the same for both groups, is the temperature today uh, at, a, at a given time. Uh, group A receives the highest temperature today, and uh, group B receives the lowest temperature today. None of these are answers to the question, because question is about 10 a.m., which is the average, very close to the average temperature. But we just give them different information, and throughout the whole experiment, we gave true information. We did not give any <coughs> false information because of the ethical considerations that we had. Also because we want to keep the name of the project fooling with facts, not fake news or things like that. So the, the expectation is that these people make a higher guess and these people make a lower guess and we can measure the difference and the response that they show to the anchors that they propose. Is that clear? Very good. So I'll show you some examples here. We give uh, some, some catchy stories, and uh, even we use emojis in them. And that was uh, great that I had uh, Yanni, my student, to come up with these questions very creatively. Because remember, it's an app, and it's a real game. It has to be exciting. And how exciting is it to say, it's 1st of July, it's a Canada day, blah, blah, blah. How many words will the last tweet tweeted by at Canada by end of the day on Monday, content. Um, then we give the first number, which is 38, the same for both groups. Then we give the length of the longest tweet and the length of the shortest tweet. Again here, and we have different categories of questions. One of the main criticisms to all the previous anchor and experiments is that they ask one or two type of main type of questions. You know, what's the price of this real estate or What's the chance of having a nuclear war? But here we could ask many questions. Actually, we ended up having around 70 different questions from different categories. And that makes us to be able to generalize what we find. 
hopefully. Uh, this is, we, ha we, we, ha we ended up having around 500 unique users playing our games. Yeah. How many questions you can answer every day? Uh, as many questions as is posted. We sent around two to three questions but per day. Three, um, P's. Exactly. Uh, because we wanted to have enough people in the treatment groups, we did not post too many questions. So we kept it low to three, two to three questions per day. And we ended up having around 150, 160 people in the control group and around 50 people in each of the treatment groups. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, but, uh, yeah? Uh, was the manipulation always like upper or lower bound? Or um, was that just an example? Almost always, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but we had to go for, like, if it's about YouTube views, we have to say the largest viewership over the past seven days and the lowest daily viewership. So we had uh, 500 people playing our games. Some people played almost all the games. Um, uh, 50 questions out of 65 that we had. And some people played just very few questions. We did not have control over this. Ideally, we wanted people to play, all people play all the questions, but when you do field experiment, which is the case here, and that's something important, because these people are playing their games, they do their best, they are not invited to our labs, they have agreed to be part of the experiment, but they have done it, I feel bad and I'm being recorded, but they, they probably have forgotten the fact that they are part of the experiment, and that's good in terms of, you know, our science. Of course, this has been reviewed twice by our ethical board once before GDPR and once after GDPR, uh, so we are fine, uh, hopefully. Uh, or I've been fine just before this presentation. But, um, but this is the most natural, um, compared to those experiments that are out there in the literature, I guess this is the most natural setting for, for anchoring analysis. So this is what we get. Here the question was about temperature in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, at a given time of the given day. The first hint was 61, that's the hint given to everyone, and that's the responses from the control group. Interestingly, a good number of people predicted hotter day, probably because we were getting closer to summer. Um, and these are other two groups that were given the coolest temperature and the highest temperature a week before, which might not have much to do with the question, but we see that it works. These people. This is the angle that they were given, and this distribution goes up, and for the other group, the distribution comes down. You might immediately notice there is also different, another difference between the treatment groups and the control group. Apart from the position, people in the treatment group are closer to one another as well. The, the deviation also decreases. I get to that in a minute. This is a different question, a tougher one. People were asked to predict the uh, Tesla uh, stock price. Uh, again, the control group and the, the treatment groups were given other numbers. And we see that, again, they move here. Actually, the deviation increases for some reason. So what you could do is to look at the difference between the anchors and look at the difference between the median of these two distributions and compare them to see how much difference in anchor leads to how much difference in predictions. And the control group could be used to normalize these values because we want to compare different questions that come from many different ranges. Here it's in the range of few hundred. If I'm asking temperature, it's in, in centigrade, it's in the range of tens. Um, so we use the control group to measure this deviation, the natural deviation, and we divide the two values I mentioned by that. Here we go. X-axis here shows the difference in anchors divided by standard deviation of the control group. Y-axis shows the difference in median of predictions of the two groups, again normalized by the standard deviation of the uh, control group. And this is what we get. And that's amazing that even though the questions come from many different a uh, vastly different type of questions, they more or less follow the same shape. And the shape basically says that the larger the difference between anchors, the larger response it gets, up until the point that it starts to saturate. Uh, but this is not quite what at least one of those theories suggests that, and what you could guess, that if I increase the anchor at some point, it doesn't work at all. 
at least as far as we could go here, and this is reasonably large. This is about seven times larger than the standard deviation of the control group. And we could not go farther, further because we did not want the gamers to think we are stupid by giving so far off hints, and it's difficult to find very far hints. But I think we did not see that it decline uh, up to this point. But then the other thing I mentioned, the deviation, is very interesting. Here, anchors really put people together. Uh, predictions in, uh, in treatment groups are very close. People all go for a value of the anchor. Uh, here, a bit less, for some reason. And the deviation in the control group is quite big in this particular equation, which is the stock price of McDonald's. Whereas here, the deviation in the treatment group is actually much larger than the deviation in the control group. For some reason, the anchor works. It moves people up, but not everyone responses equally. So this diagram shows the ratio of the standard deviations between the treatment groups and control groups versus the, the size of the anchor. And we see it increases monotonically. The further the anchors are, the larger deviation you get in the treatment groups. Basically, the further the larger the anchors are, people respond to them as a more diverse behavior. If the anchors are closed, the majority of people go for them and the deviation decreases. And everything is compared to the control group. Is that clear? Are you sure? Okay. Um, so this is the point that the deviation in the treatment groups becomes larger than the deviation of the control group. And that is about 2.5 sigma. And I feel that's around the point that anchoring starts to lose its effect. It does not, it, dra it still drags people, but not everyone. It just starts to leave people behind and things like this might happen. Now we define a modified response function that is the same, but instead of dividing by the standard deviation of the control group, we divide by the standard deviation of the treatment group. To count for the fact that you know the strength of the anchor is not how much it drags the median person, but also how much deviation we see around that median value. If I want to use anchoring to sell my property, it's important to bring majority of people to a higher point, but my risk is not proportional to the median, my risk is proportional to the standard deviation of the distribution. Because some of my, my actual buyer could be one of those people uh, down here. So, with this new definition, this curve actually starts to come back if the anchor size increases, it starts to lose its effect. Uh, and the maxima seems to be around uh, 2.5 sigma. So my recipe for you, if you want to have an effective anchor, is that run the experiment without any anchor, calculate the standard deviation in the controlled mm, population, and then go 2.5 sigma higher or lower, depending on your question, that's the most effective size for your anchor. Okay, and if you become rich by this, remember to, <laughs> to give me some money. <laughs> any questions, any objections? Yeah. Do you think that the anchor, uh, the reason for the YouTube question anchor is probably, the variation was probably because people are more familiar with YouTube these days and they do understand how much views the video like that get versus something like McDonald's stop, which a lot of people would just guess based on the previous Yeah, could be, could be, because people have a better intuition for, for that type of question. We hope to see that clear here. I'm not sure if you see from far, but uh, data points are shaped and colored based on the category, and we do not see a very clear pattern. I mean, sometimes we see, like, this, these are all pink circles, but the majority of questions are kind of mixed. But we are looking into that, actually, for what kind of questions anchoring has been systematically more effective or less effective. Yeah? Outside of gender, do you have like other demographics like data to separate people in the groups, maybe like income or like gender or education no. level? We get to that uh, a bit later to analyze individuals, but we only have the gender, the location, 
and the previous activity, which we're going to use actually a bit later. All right. Now we thought, how about instead of giving people facts, we give them opinions. Instead of saying that the temperature yesterday was this, we see we say that you know our own prediction is this. The temperature tomorrow, we predict you know 60 degrees, and we actually make some stupid predictions sometimes for science, but we gave it to people not as not as facts. We said this is our own prediction, and we expected people to ignore them, particularly when they are far from intuition. Interestingly, they did not ignore them, but they followed them even stronger. So the blue dots here are the questions that the hints are on predictions, and the pink dots are the questions that the uh, hint is fact. And we see that there is a higher anchoring where the hint was our own prediction. So people bought it uh, when we said the temperature tomorrow is going to be that high or that low. Um, is that clear what happens here? But, we did, but this is not quite anchoring, so it's giving people some information and people buy it from you. Um, which could be, I mean, I don't want to generalize that to real life scenarios, but you know, if you read and put something on paper or something on the internet from someone else with an interesting name, probably you would, you would accept it. It's easier for you to accept it rather than um, the case that you have to work out yourself and make a more informed prediction. And when we look at the deviation as well, uh, the same thing happens. For, for these uh, hints that were PTF predictions, uh, the standard deviation is very small. Majority of people just go for them. Uh, in the anchoring literature, there is something saying that super forecasters, or people who have very good intuitions, are less affected by anchors. Uh, more informed people are more difficult to manipulate. To check that, we look because people have been playing the game before our experiment for two years, we calculated uh, accuracy score for each play. And we then look at the level of anchoring, the response to anchors as a function of their accuracy score before our experiment. And it does not show a very clear pattern. Um, uh, no matter if you have been very, uh, sorry, this is the error. So these people are very good predictors, and these people are not so good predictors. They show more or less the same level of bias, uh, which, at least as far as our data suggests, um, there is no difference between good predictors or bad predictors. They just uh, are being primed by our predictions, by our hints. We looked also at gender. Um, this shows the level of uh, bias that individual shows for two different genders, we find some female individuals who are very much biased, our anchors work out on them very well, but when you look at the total population, they are not significantly different. Actually, if you run the t-test or anything, uh, no hypothesis is not rejected. The two populations are statistically the same. But as I said, there were a few less individuals among the males who were extremely biased. All right, we had another idea to check for another uh, bias, and that's called home country bias. People tend to think of their home country higher than any other country. Uh, I think you, you, you are very familiar with that concept even in the US. <laughs> And we thought, oh, World Cup is coming. That's a great opportunity to check that. Um, we asked people to predict the results of matches, and probably people tend to overestimate the strength of their own home country. And that's the first time we can quantify that. Actually, it's a very known fact, uh, particularly in investment decisions. Investors tend to favor companies or places in their home country. Even if they see the economy in their home country is not doing that well, they feel much more secure to invest in their home country rather than any other country that they know very little about. Uh, that we failed miserably with this experiment because, uh, well, US and Canada, if you remember, the two countries that we had many users from were not at World Cup. Uh, we had some countries like Australia and Great Britain, uh, but for some reason, people from those countries did not play our game. 
we had two people from Great Britain playing our game, and that was me and my students. So <laughs> we tried, but that's the other problem. If that was a lab experiment, we could bring in enough people from enough countries. But because it was a field experiment, we simply did not get enough uh, participants. Maybe next one, or maybe a yeah, sports where uh, Americans have something to say. About. <laughs> <laughs> and they know the exact name of the, uh, the, the match, in this case, football. <laughs> okay, something I did not talk about, and that actually leads me to our future experiments, hopefully, is that you can pick up challengers. Um, and those are players of the game that, for some reason, you think you want to challenge them. You either know them from Facebook or offline work, because you sign in, by the way, using your Facebook account. Or when you look at the uh, leaderboard, uh, you pick up them because you say, oh, they're doing well, I want to challenge them. So you have a list of challengers, and each, um, each question, when it, uh, the answer is known, you will be notified if you had a better prediction for your challenger. But that's only after the game, it's post-event. Uh, it does not affect your prediction whatsoever. It might just give you some more incentive to try harder next round. But what we are planning is to actually use this social information uh, to feed you with this information before you make your prediction. You know, you definitely have heard about wisdom of the crowd or collective learning, where actually if the information, if the predictions of other people are fed to you, that might make you, uh, make you uh, to come up with a better prediction or find a better solution to a question. But also, the other side of this story is the Herodin effect, where someone says something that is not even true, and the majority of people just follow them. And this social interaction actually amplifies the error in the system. And there have been literature and papers, including, uh, of course, uh, David's work, uh, suggesting that those could happen even within the same system. So that's something that we're going to check. Uh, we have different scenarios. Uh, we can have a random selection of people, or we can have uh, people you have listed as your challengers, or we can uh, have people who are known to be good already, the super forecasters, and we aggregate the predictions and feed to you as a hint before you make your prediction. And then as the system evolves and more people make predictions, we can check if the answer gets better and better, or actually herding is happening. How to aggregate this information? Of course, we can look at the mean prediction of these people around you, the median. We can provide you with distribution numbers, like, oh, this is the mean and this is the deviation from it. Probably it's not going to work because this is already too complicated. Or we can make a weighted average. We can average over predictions of super forecasters based on their previous accuracy and feed that to the newer predictors to see this emergence or divergence. I just put this here because I need a lot of uh, inputs uh, to design a proper experiments, and please feel free to make comments on suggestions. With that, I'd like just to uh, thank uh, my students, Yanni and Mati, who have been great in providing these slides uh, literally this morning, <laughs> and of course you for your attention. Thank you very much. We thought about it, but um, you know, in reality, you need to have the platform, you need to know the people. Even with this game, which is not even that serious, it was pretty difficult to get this going. You know? Of course, we could have our own platform, but then the problem would be how to recruit players. Mm. And I'm, I'm very new to the world of experimentation with humans. As a physics student, I was um, in the lab all the time in my undergrad, and that was super easy. You did not need to have constant form from laser uh, <laughs> instruments, but when you work with people, it's very difficult. Um, we thought about it, but I, I don't have any access to any platform. If you know something. Yeah, I just know that there are commercial ones that do exist, but I don't have any mm -hmm. great needs for it. But you have to provide the price and you know, the incentives, right? Well, there's, well, there's a political betting one, mm. I have a space in the name of it, where you can uh, place bets pretty much on which way political decisions are going to go. Um, and so people are putting up their own money for this. Mm -hmm. So you would 
I would get at the pay you just have to connect with the company or a group that runs it. And I would definitely help you generalize this because I mean, a criticism to this would be to steal again. People still might not take it seriously enough, but when they put in money, that's that was that their money. But then angry it cause them to lose money or get more money, so that's yeah. the next thing. Yeah, thank you. Did users lose trust in the hints after the treatment? Um, yes, because you see in some people uh, play 50 times. And I did not show, but we looked at the effect size as they played more and more games, and it did not decline. It was more or less random, uh, fluctuating around, you know, uh, typical behavior. Hmm? Just on top of that question, um, first I thought it was brilliant. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I was curious with your um, the implementation of the, the hints, and was wondering if there was any um, anything in the hints that you think could have also influenced the anchor, like if you presented perhaps like a different. You know, a different number within those those hints, and what that influence? I didn't quite get the question. Um, I guess what the hints, uh, what like for example the the hints that you get with the royal wedding example, could there have been like um, a number within those hints that additionally influenced people's decision making? Well, the hints did have numbers in them already, but you mean? Yeah, like so for example, if the initial question was something about, um, you know. The temperature, like at you know, at this particular time, um, and then the hint perhaps had a different number in it. Yes, we tried that. That's what, uh, I wish I had the slide. Um, yes, because we found out people might just copy the number, and that's not really anchoring. That's people have been lazy. Mm -hmm. So we had some questions like uh, Reddit uh, submissions, and then the hint was the number of users or like people members of the subreddit, which is not even related, and people did not copy them. Okay. So they play the game. Um, of course, when I say people, the majority of them. So in a way, the, when I gave some examples, the you know the background number that is not even related to the question, it did not work here. Oh, actually. it didn't. Okay. It didn't. No. When we gave like uh, irrelevant hints, people were, were, did not go for them. Yeah, I've read that the rash, um, irrelevant anchors do, do sometimes fool people, so it's interesting that that would yeah. have been. Well, I think it has to do with the fact that people are you know, heavy players of right. the game and they read the hints properly. Okay. Yeah. It was, actually it was a good news for us because we thought uh, if people just copy and paste uh, the number we have given them, it's, it's just, you know, it's not the anchoring effect as we know. So I guess like a, the irrelevant, if it is irrelevant, it could still be anchoring, you know, because it's still pulling people, so even if something in the hints was a number, it could be still pulling people in a different, yeah. different direction, depending yeah. on what was in it. But, yeah, it's That's true. Yeah, but I think we wanted to be conservative to just capture strong anchoring. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, I was wondering if, because you did this experiment in a very pre application where people were playing without the idea or without the context that they're actually doing in the experiment. <coughs> if you compare that with an online experiment platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk, because would it because I was just wondering if first of all I'm not sure if that's the direction of this research, but for me, because I did some experiments on mechanical work, it would be good to know how people if that effect exists there, if people are more like people are more prejudiced there, or less prejudiced there, or something like that. Like yep. that would be something that would be interesting to me. Do you think would that be interesting? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's related to the question the other gentleman said. Uh, we want to generalize this, and mm -hmm. ideally, we want to try it on different platforms, different settings. In mechanical work probably people are paid anyway, even if they make not very good guesses. So we might expect to see more anchoring, more biases there. But the question is that if the two point five sigma <laughs> Uh, is the same there as well because you always can compare different anchors within the same system. I totally agree. We we need to go that way. And just as a, a follow on uh, to that point, if you do have interpreters and you were compensating people, you could give people bonuses for accuracy. And if you get to the the, the question on the money side, which is if the if people really have a dog in that fight for, in terms of accuracy, um, does it change their behavior? Um, so, so, but I, I also had another uh, another question, which was you, you begin with a bit of a, a teaser at the beginning, 
and, I, and I think if you answered it, I'm sorry that I missed it, but you said, the more you play, the more active you become. And you said the question, is this selection or learning, right? Is it because the people who are accurate get, you know, feel good about themselves and stay in, or is it because people are getting bad at this because they learn in some fashion? And you did provide a hint that anchoring, the effects of anchoring does not decline uh, over time. Uh, but it's, that's a somewhat different question because you, the anchor could affect you, but I affect us both equally, but you could still be more accurate than me. Um, and so, uh, so my question is, is it, is it learning selection or is it learning or is it both? So like one, you know, and one's between subjects, one within subjects. Do you see, if you look within subjects, do people uh, become more accurate, for example? Mm -hmm. A oh, very good question. And one thing is that we asked about 50 questions and 70 questions, but the largest number that one individual answered out of those 70 questions was 50. The effect that I reported at the beginning is when we compare people, you know, with 50 answers to probably 500, uh, sorry, 5,000 answers. So even if the learning happens or even if the selection happens, it's, uh, it takes much longer than our own experiments in the anchoring experiments. Oh, I see. Uh, so the anchoring does not, not losing its value would be just going from here to here, you know, okay. which is statistically. But the questions are still very valid and very relevant. Well, how can we explain this type of selection or learning? As I said, we started looking into that and uh, we have found, identified both scenarios. Uh, but uh, if you invite me one more time, a bit later, <laughs> yeah. I hopefully could have a better answer. Just by the way, just for more data, you might look at Good Judgment Open, uh, which is a sort of prediction thing, because they're, they're doing a lot of anchoring, because you get to see the guesses of prior people, the mean guesses of prior people, but if you scrape that in some type of systematic way, you could probably infer the anchor that each person saw um, and see whether that resulted in dysfunctional occurring. So, I'm just curious about this idea about people learning how to be better given the nature of the questions they get. And I'm trying to puzzle through what could be the thing that they're learning. And I can think of maybe two things. One is maybe they're just doing more work, more research, look, finding their own hints to better estimate. Or also, maybe they're better at interpreting the hints that they're given, not the ones that you manipulate, but the ordinary hints in the classroom. Is, is, could you think of, I mean, any other reasonable explanation? I think as you play more and more and uh, you gain more points and more competitors and more challenges, you might just spend more time yeah. thinking about You can measure that, can't you? With data uh, we eventually can, but because this data has been collected before we started working with them, yeah. uh, we don't have. But yes, we can measure how much time they spend on the question from the point that the question pop, pops on the screen and uh, the time that they submit the answer. We can measure that and see just more thinking and more time. I think, I mean, it's science, right? Everything happens at the same time, probably, with different ways. I think they spend more time, they become more competitive, they learn how to interpret the hints. Uh, they might also spend more time researching, uh, but that, again, we can only say when we look at the timing. Uh, majority of my friends that play, uh, I ask them, like, they just read and answer. They do not go off off app and research the question. But have they answered 5,000? 5,000 questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it kind of following up on that? Because it's not about like doing survey data to like get those answers from the, like, like if you're really playing this game, more than like, I would assume that like, answer a survey or something around, do you um, research these questions or how long do you think you spend on it? That kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Uh, quite frankly, we haven't thought about it even though I'm officially not in social science department. <laughs> Thank you. So most of the examples that you gave here are about numerical predictions, right? And But when you are trying to connect it to decisions that we make every day, most of them are not numerical, so, you know, voting or... You, and you have these experiments about the World Cup, but that, you know, so have you thought of other situation where you're going yeah, to use? Yeah, actually the, the app itself has lots of categorical questions, just rank this list. Uh, our choice of numeric questions only was out of convenience because we wanted to quantify and we wanted to come up with a 
with something like this curve, uh, and that's because probably I'm a physicist, mm -hmm. uh, we like numbers, but uh, mm -hmm. even for the World Cup questions, we did ask for the goal difference rather than who is winning. Uh, but that doesn't mean that um, categorical questions are not as interesting. It's just more difficult to collapse different type of questions into one curve. Also, um, I think not all the decisions we make during the day are categorical. So we make lots of numerical uh, decisions as well. Um, but yeah, uh, totally, I mean, it uh, would be ideal to also be able to systematically ask for uh, um, qualitative or uh, categorical questions. Yeah, one so more so on this page, you mentioned that all these points bore into this curve. So, so how do you get this curve? Is that some theory behind it? Or, or just uh, it? No, it's just a moving average with the uh, confidence in several uh, different aspects. Yes, yes. It's the, so the default R, uh, uh, low lowest, lowest uh, <laughs> yeah, which is not great, so but okay. hope you forgive me for that. Uh, maybe you have another one? I don't know, I'm just saying that uh, I'm afraid the bell tolls for the, uh, we, uh, we, we're, we're at three o'clock, but uh, so I was saying that would be the last question, and then, and then people can stick around informally uh, and chat. About this with each other and with our visitors. So, uh, but I want to thank you. I think you made us all a little less biased. So. <laughs>